Okay, so I'll start here. So my name is Val Leitner with the Sam Proctor Oral History Program, and I am here with Dr. Jane Brockman on Seahorse Key. This uh, interview is part of the Seahorse Key Marine Lab series, and this is uh, specifically for the Public Humanities Grant series. We're going to do a walkabout today, and Jane will talk about uh, her experiences up here at the lighthouse, and then we'll go down to the beach. First, I'd like to have her talk about some photographs that we have from the archives that we've been processing. And uh, these photographs will also be included with the oral history file. So welcome, Jane, and thank you so much. OK, great. So um, could you please, uh, you, you can point to the photographs. Just tell us a little bit about each one that you know something about. OK, so I started uh, to come out to Seahorse Key uh, as soon as I was hired. So I was hired in at the University of Florida in the Department of Zoology um, in uh, 1976. And um, so uh, right there from the beginning, I, and I was hired to teach animal behavior. And so I wanted to bring my animal behavior students out uh, to do some research. And so right from the beginning, I started to, to do that. And so, so, um, so er in the early years, um, I was just bringing my classes out here. But we often worked on horseshoe crabs because uh, it was a, an animal that was available here in large numbers. And it was uh, possible for us as a class to collect data and then analyze it together. So it was a real research experience that the students had. They can carry a project through to completion, really. Um, and so, uh, so that was the earliest, that was early years. And then in 1990, I had a, I got a grant to work on horseshoe crabs. And um, I did that from 90 to about 97. And then life took over and I became department chair and a few other things. And, um, and then, uh, and I was gone for years. So I had a few students in there working out here, um, but not, <coughs> I wasn't working out here very much myself. And then I had another grant in 2007. And so I worked very intensively here 2007 to 10. Um, and then I've been out a few times since then. I mean, I've had a few projects since then. So these uh, pictures seem to me to be uh, primarily from the early days. And you can see how many horseshoe crabs we had on some days. Um, and I recognize this individual. So I know that this was quite early excuse me, quite early on, um, like um, it would have been maybe 1980, something like that. Um, because this is Linda Peterson, and she became the wife of one of my graduate students. <laughs> so I recognized her. And, uh, and so this would have been a class. We would have been uh, taking data on things like the number, the group sizes, and uh, the behavior of the animals. Um, and uh, I suspect this picture is from that same period. Um, we uh, marked and weighed the animals. We marked the animals with um, embossing tape, with tags that you make from you, one of these guns that you make little, you remember what embossing tape is. <laughs> and uh, so we made these tags uh, with unique numbers and then put them onto the horseshoe crabs with just with a with a thumbtack, which isn't seem quite so nice, but they didn't they didn't even stop nesting, so I think it wasn't too bad for them. So this is what we were doing here. I don't know uh, exactly what year it would have been, but um, based on we based on the old-fashioned tape, it probably in the early 80s. Um, and this uh, is another field trip um, I took with my students, and I recognize she is this is Linda Fink. She is um, one of my graduate students, um, and uh, so so this would have been mid '80s, I think, uh, or maybe even late '80s, mid '80s, I think probably. Um, and this <laughs> this is a long time ago. This you can see how beautiful that red bay is. This is the same tree that's right here. How beautiful that tree was. That was just a magnificent tree. And then one night uh, there was an electrical storm. <laughs> And it just exploded that tree, <laughs> took the top off of it, 
and you can see that it, but it grew back. You can see that it grew back and now it has been killed by this disease that's going around. Um, and um, so I, I don't know what, when this picture was taken, um, but uh, one of my graduate students, um, Bonnie Ploger, uh, did her PhD sitting up on there because there were um, pelicans nesting in all the trees right around here on both sides, all the trees that are around uh, the end of the, of the lighthouse here. And by being up so high, she could actually see down into the nests and see what the animals were doing and sort of the de details of uh, <laughs> some of the lovely things they were doing. Um, they have uh, uh, what's called sublicide. Uh, that is, they, uh, one chick is born before the other, and the older chick, if there isn't enough food, the older chick will kill the younger chick. And that does happen here. Um, but pelicans are extremely resistant to um, starvation, and those poor things will go on for days and days uh, without being fed. It's very quite something to watch. But anyway, she did get a PhD on that. She was, she was a great student. Um, and um, so these two pictures are just field trips. Uh, these two slides are just field trips. I don't know. They would be from the 80s. And then this, we know, uh, as Kenny was just pointing out, we know this is Henry Coulter and Al Dinsmore and one of the assistants. And uh, um, as Kenny pointed out, uh, you can see in the background that there aren't any mangroves. And so we know that that was, uh, all the mangroves were killed out here uh, in this basin uh, in the 83-84 freeze. And since, and, and they were just sticks. For years and years and years, it was just sticks out there. And because um, they were big mangroves, just like they are now, they were huge mangroves. Uh, and uh, and then slowly a few <laughs> mangroves started to come back in, and uh, black mangroves, and then there are one or two red mangroves, and now you see what it's like. It's just there are huge numbers of them. So this had to have been, um, you know, in the late '80s, sometime probably. Um, I don't know exactly when. Henry took over, uh, but anyway. So those are those are those. So thank you, Jane. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we'll move over to the lighthouse, please, and and uh, we'd love for you to talk a little bit about your experience with staying here with the students, because you'd stay for extended periods of time. You've done that for many many years, and what it was like to do that. You talked about uh, assigning your students to make meals and take care of that. And, you know, just your general experience and, and the rattling door during <laughs> storms. So um, go wherever you'd like or feel comfortable and, and please tell us about your experience with the lighthouse. Okay, well, um, stay in the shade. Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah, so I um, uh, spent a lot of time in this, uh, in the early days, so in, um, so when Chuck Haven was still uh, running the place, uh, still the manager, um, and in the early days, so this would have been this early period before 1990. I think that's right. You don't know when. When did Henry take over? Do you know? 92? Uh, 90, 92? 92, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. So. All through that period, 76 to 92, um, we were uh, uh, bringing classes out here, and then 1992, we were still we were doing our research, um, and we would stay here uh, in this. You know, it holds 24 students or something like that, and I would bring my class out. Uh, later, I had to make my class larger, and so I brought them back in two pieces. But originally, in the first years, um, they uh, they could all stay here, and so we stayed for both Friday night and Saturday night, and uh, which is long enough to really be able to get a project going. So if there were horseshoe crabs, we did a joint project on horseshoe crabs. But uh, other times uh, we did projects on 
the terrestrial animals um, primarily that are here, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about those in a minute. Um, so uh, yeah, we occupy. Uh, you never got very much sleep when that happened, uh, when you have, you know, like 18 undergraduates. Um, but anyway, um, they, uh, many of them has, as I think uh, Harvey said, many of them never done anything like this ever. And so I insisted, for example, it was too, it's not enough room in here to be able to everybody make their own food. So I insisted that everybody cooks together and that we actually have, uh, you know, division of duties and things like that. So some people cleaned up and some people cooked and, and they, many of them had never done anything like this. And um, so uh, we got some interesting meals on various occasions. <laughs> um, but I insisted that we have only one meal because it was too complicated. And so, of course, the vegetarians determined what it was that we ate. Um, and, um, you know, it's usually spaghetti or something in these huge vats of, of food. And they, they went with the TA to buy the food um, beforehand and did all the cooking themselves. And so it was, it was really more than just a field trip. It was also for them a, an experience that they'd never, just never had before, anything like that. Yeah, um, on the whole, the students were really quite good. There were a few problems. Um, eventually, I said no alcohol because, you know, there was a, one, one time there was, there was some. But um, on the whole, uh, they did very well. And they came down on various occasions. I thought you might have a picture. I can give you that picture. I thought you, sometimes they came and they were pretty sure this was going to be a very boring weekend. So they would bring various things of their own, you know, like the volleyball. And these students were bringing um, uh, Frisbee along. And they happened to have a black Frisbee that uh, was they were throwing on the beach. And then, you know, it got busy. Horseshoe crabs came in. They started doing things. Uh, the tide was coming in. The uh, Frisbee uh, started to float. And male horseshoe crabs will grab on to almost anything that has any semblance to a female. And this male <laughs> grabbed a hold of this <laughs> black frisbee. <laughs> and the students, of course, were quite enchanted with this. I mean, they had no expectation that that would happen. I mean, it was really an interesting observation that that's what the animals would be doing. And that was in the days before we knew very much about horseshoe crab mating behavior. Yeah, so... Um, was there anything else I was going to say about that? You mentioned before uh, different aspects uh, that make the experience of staying here unique. And so, for example, you talked about that door <laughs> and latching it because it was kind of creepy if there was a storm. So could you tell us about that and, and any, anything else that really makes staying in this structure unique? Oh, well, there's a lot of things. Um, yes, uh, in the early days, there used to be squirrels around. and. Uh, the squirrels would come and rob, if people came and put their backpacks on this front porch, the squirrels would come and rob their backpacks <laughs> of, of whatever they had. <laughs> and uh, so um, when Chuck was in charge of things, we were only allowed to stay in this end of the building, uh, which, has a, which had a kitchen uh, that was all gas, and we weren't allowed to use the electricity. So it was wonderful. It was absolutely quiet out here without the generator on, but it did have a few, you know, we had to use the gas uh, refrigerator, uh, which never worked very well and so forth. Uh, and the gas lights, um, had to light those old mantles, <laughs> which <laughs> we were terrible at. Anyway, um, so we uh, would stay down here. And one morning when we were in this first room here, this first room here, the, <laughs> Those squirrels actually got in the building and uh, clambered up the Venetian blinds. You know, it had Venetian blinds, which, and, and anything that was bend those Venetian blinds <laughs> makes just an unbelievable noise. Anyway, um, so yeah, the, um, on a stormy night, um, it, things would rattle and um, 
wind would blow through the building and, you know, lots of squeaks and clatters and things like that. Um, uh, and it can really absolutely pour out here. It just rains, just absolute cats and dogs out here. Um, anyway, um, so things that make it a unique place to stay. Um, it can be hotter than Hades. Um, in the summertime, I never taught out here in the summertime. My classes were in the spring. And, uh, <clears throat> but um, occasionally I would, I'd come out when Frank Maturo was out here um, with his uh, marine biology class. And uh, gosh, I don't know how he managed it. I would come out uh, just for a day and just absolutely cook out here in the summertime. <laughs> Um, but, uh, there, I came out here one time and Frank was in the kitchen down there and, uh, he had this thing, he was working <laughs> and he was making ice cream for his <laughs> marine biology students. It was wonderful. He, he was so good with those students and for them, it was just, uh, they'd spend a week out here and, um, it was such a remarkable experience uh, because they were, you know, living with a faculty member and um, uh, and graduate students, and there were, you know, maybe twelve of them or something, and they had their own projects, and they were really being scientists, and it wasn't something that um, an experience that you could normally get anywhere else. Um, no. Anyway, Frank was great with the students, and and uh, they were able to. Uh, I mean, they were. It was just an experience. I had the same thing. I know a couple of people in Gainesville that took my course in the early days, and it's just an unforgettable experience for them. Uh, they just um, nothing, nothing like uh, coming out here to this place. It was um, such a wonderful, um, peaceful, unique experience, and then when. In the springtime, you don't see it now, but in the springtime, there are so many birds out here. Um, and uh, it was just a, a wonderful time to come out. Um, maybe I should show you uh, what one of my graduate students worked on. My first graduate student, in fact, did uh, a large portion of his dissertation out here. Uh, he was not working in the marine environment. Um, in fact, uh, Archie Carr used to say that what was really unique about Seahorse Key was not all this marine stuff out there, but the terrestrial environment. And uh, that there's all sorts of plants. It, it being so high, you get plants that aren't found anywhere else uh, around on any of these other islands. Um, and insects and, and birds nesting and so forth that were, just weren't anywhere else. Um, so. And uh, so we, or I'll come, I'll show you what we, what we worked on, what he worked on, what Jeff Lucas worked on. Uh, there's some, I saw some down here at the end of the building. So do you know, uh, do you know about ant lions? You know about ant lions? So he did a PhD on these ant lions, and um, you can actually see one over here. It's it's uh, been traveling around. There's one that'll be right in there. I don't think that's the one. I I oh here it is. There it is. They're called doodle bugs, <laughs> and they <laughs> and they make these little holes, and he uh, actually. Um, talk to a, because we noticed that the hole was lined with very fine sand. And he, um, uh, and these little guys will go down into the uh, sand, they go around in circles, throwing sand back with their head. And uh, the effect of that, and if they get anything large, they'll grab it in their jaws and throw it out. Um, and the effect of this is that the lining of the, of the uh, pit is uh, finer sand than, it's the finest sand that is available to them. 
Uh, here you have one that is starting a little, a little uh, um, pit right there. And they, you, you, here's a little track. You can see the little tracks. Um, and they, they molt just like, you know, like a lot of insects do. These are juveniles. These are the larval stage of uh, something that kind of looks like a damselfly. It's a, and there's an oldest, older one over there in that deep pit. So he showed, he, he actually did the physics of this, worked with a physics professor and did the physics of, um, this is the angle of repose of the sand and um, the fact that it's lined with this very fine sand, which means that if anything falls in the pit, it can't get out because it's, it's um, uh, just has this extremely fine sand. Um, yeah, this little guy. <laughs> there we are. He wants to go back to the sand. <laughs> anyway, so it was a very nice, a nice thesis. Um, he um, uh, did this physics of the sand. Um, he also uh, showed that um, uh, they have um, sort of optimal foraging. They they uh, change uh, their behavior. So um, if they're getting a lot to eat, they will only... So once they grab something, it kind of messes up their pit and they have to rebuild their pit. So, so sometimes they'll let a very small thing come into the pit and get out uh, rather than grabbing it. If they're very hungry and they haven't had anything to eat for a while, they will grab even small things. But if uh, they're getting a, a nice... Uh, a regular source of larger food, they will then uh, go give up on a small thing. Um, anyway, so he did it several, and there are several species of antlions here. There's a different one, so there's this one that's out in the open, there's a different one underneath the house, <laughs> different species, that lives in, in protected areas, and then there's another one that's out, uh, and you can just see their little tracks, not so little, they're pretty good sized, their tracks, uh, and they don't make pits, and they just walk along underneath the sand, and and when something encounters something, they grab it and and um, yeah, just come out of the sand and grab it. So anyway, so that was one of my students. The other one, another one, was Bonnie Floger, who did this study on pelicans, and both of those were in the 80s. And then more recently, I had a student uh, working on wasps. Um, Miss Cassiterus, uh, which is a, it's a little paper wasp, and uh, Ron spent a lot of time in that very palm tree right there. They nest on the undersides of the palm fronds, and um, <coughs> and then I had a second student that did some experimental studies uh, on the uh, uh, paper wasps that nest out here. So, and I think. So other than the horseshoe crab projects, I think that was the made those were the major uh, theses and dissertations that I I did out or that my students did out here. The the wasp that you're talking about, uh, would that be the same wasp that people I hear hear them commonly referring to as uh, guinea wasps? Might be. Yeah, they're okay. real small. Real small, and, yellow. Yeah, and they don't really. I mean, they can sting, and they do sting, mm -hmm. but. They uh, mostly just escape if you bother them. I mean, they will b a sting, but they're not, it's not much of a sting. Yeah, so they're real tiny, and they, they nest on the undersides of the, of the palm fronds. So <laughs> anyway. Are there any other um, terrestrial animals that you wanted to highlight, since you mentioned that quote by Archie Carr? Or, or is there something more in particular that he was also talking yeah, about? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what he was referring to. Uh, I mean, obviously, Harvey talked a bit about uh, some of the animals here. Um, the gopher tortoises that he talked about um, used to, I don't remember what year it was, I'm trying to remember who remembers seeing them. He, that gopher tortoise used to walk by here every day and um, uh, well, you know, if there's something like that going by, your students want to feed it, right? So we had, <laughs> we had some cherry tomatoes, and they just love cherry tomatoes. And uh, <laughs> so every morning, <laughs> this thing would come by, and we would give it a cherry tomato. Um, 
Yeah, so um, that is uh, the squirrels and that and the birds. Those are the main things. And in the springtime, we come out here very regularly uh, in the spring, often on Easter weekend. And uh, because with the horseshoe crabs, we were trying to hit the new and full moon high tides. Uh, you would sometimes in March, uh, you would sometimes get a fallout of, of migrants. And one year, Jeff, the year that Jeff was here, uh, we had over a hundred species of birds. Uh, we had like painted all the buntings and, and finches. We had all kinds of warblers. I mean, every tree was just filled with birds. It was just a remarkable thing. And Doug Levy used to bring his uh, ornithology class out here every spring. And they would, uh, at that, just about that time. And they, uh, yeah, they always enjoyed that. So it, it's, it's an amazing place. And the birds often come in quite tired because mm. they've just been coming across the, the gulf. Mm -hmm. And um, we've had them just, I mean, they, they'll be right there. They won't even move. They're just so busy eating. Uh, and when we're sitting on the beach sometimes, well, I have a picture somewhere of, of somebody <laughs> feeding horseshoe crab eggs uh, to, I guess it was a red start or, you know, some small warbler that does not normally eat horseshoe crab eggs, but it was sitting on the beach. And so uh, we just made some eggs available and there, there took them. What anyway. are, oh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. What are some changes that you have seen over time? You've been coming here since 1977, right? Mm -hmm. What are some changes that you've seen over time with, for example, uh, the lighthouse? Oh, well, the, yeah, the lighthouse, uh, as, as we just talked about, the kitchen has much improved um, prior to that. Well, there were some changes to it. So originally, uh, this was, um, was a gas kitchen and the other was an electric kitchen. Um, and the gas kitchen is pretty much the same as it was. I mean, it's, uh, I think they got rid of that old refrigerator in there. There were no cell phones or anything like that. There was a radio that you could use that never worked. Uh, so you were really isolated uh, out here. Um, and uh, yeah, it pretty much looks the same. Um, the, they've done a nice job of keeping, uh, uh, you know, every year or two they have to fix the screens, the stairs, the doors, you know, there's a lot of upkeep to this building, a lot of upkeep. And uh, they do a very nice job of, of keeping it. Uh, but there's upkeep, like, you know, keeping the, the um, uh, plumbing working and so forth as well. <laughs> um, the kitchen uh, in the far end was always a little, uh, well, uh, yeah, you, would, you wouldn't want to uh, pick anything up off that floor uh, or really even the counters. You had to, you know, did seem and you'd never been able to drink the water. Uh, when I was department chair, um, we had the water checked. I remember this very vividly. The, the man said, so, so I was talking to the guy on the phone about it, and uh, he said, so, so where is this? Uh, where's this sample from? And uh, I said, well, it's, it's our field station. He said, are there a lot of um, cows around? Or? <laughs> And I said, no, no, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's out on an island. He said, well, this has the highest level of phosphorus or whatever. It, is it nitrogen? I think it's phosphorus. I think it's, I think that's right. Uh, of it, anyway, it was, you know, something that you didn't want in the water <laughs> of any place I've ever <laughs> looked at. It. And that came from all the guano, from the birds coming, leaching down through the soil. And of course the the well is, is below this. It was a little bit below, down the hill, and so all this stuff just leached through the sand and got into the well. So uh, we've never been drink. drink uh, we never drank the water out here, um, uh, but that's okay. You know, I just bring gallon jugs of water. It's that's not a it's not a big problem. I think it's probably not as big a problem now with 
you know, when the, there aren't any birds around, but uh, yeah, who knows? <laughs> now you mentioned Frank Maturo. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, Frank and um, your impression of him and maybe tell an anecdote or two? Yeah, Frank um, had uh, quite a number. I was looking at the list of theses and dissertations that came from out here, and he had quite a number of students that, uh, whose names I remembered, you know, as I was looking down through the list, um, who did research out here. Um, so he had quite a few projects, where at least part of the project was, was uh, done in the marine environment out here. Um, so there was a project on the fiddler crabs and the mangroves and the various things uh, out here. Um, but mostly what I remember about him is, is being with his class. Um, and he was very, as I think Harvey said, he was pretty free and easy about his class. He wasn't too demanding of them, and they had a great time out here. I mean, a serious <clears throat> time, but also very much enjoyed. And they would cook on that grill over there. They would cook out their dinners every, you know, most nights. and. Um, They'd always ask me if I wanted, and I never wanted to eat with them because, you know, it'd be like 11 o'clock at night before there was any food <laughs> available. Because <laughs> they, you know, didn't get the cold started fast enough and so forth and so on. But anyway, um, so yeah, it was um, a good time and, and, uh, and, and some serious projects and a number of the students then followed up with their own undergraduate research projects that they did as well. Um, so there were a number of papers that came out of um, Seahorse, um, a number of uh, research, you know, undergraduate research projects as well. And you were part of the task force um, that was charged with, by the university, with uh, compiling information for a report on um, the island and the university's presence on the island and yes the, the there, there were arose a problem which was that so originally um, Seahorse Key was what is called type 2 center and that's a center like women's studies or you know or the Latin American studies center I mean it was a high-level um, center that had its own budget and in one of the iterations of things that happened in Tallahassee, that um, the, the center was um, uh, moved to the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and ultimately was moved to zoology, more or less to hide it from the, the powers that be from the legislature so that um, uh, because if there had been a separate line they that was what they were doing that year was putting line dra you know lines through uh, and, it, and they so they wanted the budget to be protected and so they put it down into zoology and zoology really didn't know much about it I mean it had always been f either Elo Pierce or Frank Maturo were the ones that were sort of taking care of it. It was kind of their baby, and you know, zoology didn't really pay any attention to it particularly. I mean, our students went out there, but uh, came out here, but uh, and so when it got to zoology, the chair who was Frank Nordley at the time, wanted some discussion of what do we do with it and how do we make it function well and and how do we get more people out there and. And what does it need to have serious research going on? Um, so I always did, um, Harvey and I have done more research out, most of, a lot of the research of recent years. Um, but it is a bit hard to do uh, a lot of kinds of research out here because, um, you know, it's a marine environment and, and things rust and there's the, the uh, electricity is not very reliable. It's, I mean, it's a wonderful place as a field station, but it's not a marine lab exactly. And so the question was sort of what should we do with it and how should we as zoology interact with it? And so that's why that task force report was written. 
and uh, we didn't really even know anything about, we as a department didn't know much about the budget or um, what the status of the various, um, you know, the boats. I mean, we didn't even know it was out here, basically. And so that was just um, putting that, putting it together. And I had been working out here for so long that, um, yeah, because that was 97 or something like that. And so I had been doing that research project out here for quite a while. Um, yeah, and I guess it was not too long after that that the uh, the Elo Pierce, the the bigger boat that we big boat that we had, um, sprouted a, a flight of termites, which uh, was reported to the dean, who um, decided that students shouldn't be going out on a boat <laughs> that had termites. <laughs> so the boat was salvaged. <laughs> and then for quite a while we didn't have a we didn't have a boat. And then I not I don't remember exactly how we got this one. Um, but I'm I'm sure it was a donation that that we had. I don't, I don't remember the details on how we got it. But and that report was it information only or did it also come with uh, your task force's recommendations? Yeah, it was it had recommendations that about uh, what needed to be done to get more research out here, to get more classes going out here. Uh, the dean had complained that there wasn't, didn't seem like enough activity, although when you look at the lists, it was more or less ignorance, you know. I mean, he really didn't know what was going on out here, so he assumed there wasn't very much. But when you actually looked at the list of people that visited research projects out here, et cetera, there was quite a bit. Um, but um, anyway, yes, that was what kinds of things. One of the things, uh, for example, is that you would think <laughs> you would think that being on an island uh, in the marine environment that you would have seawater available to you. But the seawater um, came from the backside here, which is solid mud at low tide. <laughs> it was it's mud. It's about that thick. It is solid mud out there. And so um, that, that tank that's halfway up the hill, that had the seawater in it. And it was a gravity feed seawater uh, system. And um, yeah, it smelled like hydrogen sulfide because it had all the stuff down in the bottom of it. Um, there's now a new tank. But anyway, that was one of the things is that the seawater was not good enough quality to raise most animals in it, including horseshoe crabs. So when I came, which are pretty tolerant of most things, um, so when I came to doing my project here in um, uh, 2007, eight, nine, in that time, we were doing a lot of rearing of eggs and we had to bring water from seawater system uh, which is actually from the Whitney lab, which is on the other coast. Uh, we brought big uh, carboys of, of seawater for raising our, because the water was too, too, uh, um, they had too much hydrogen sulfide. The, the, the embryos are very sensitive to hydrogen sulfide and there was too much in the water for <laughs> our little guys. <laughs> so uh, Henry always thought that was absolutely crazy. We would bring, I mean, they would weigh to like 40 pounds a piece, you know. We'd bring these big carboys of seawater to see or ski. He thought that was completely ludicrous. But that was what we had to do to get the animals, to rear the animals up. And then we took them back to the lab in, in Gainesville and reared them up there. Um, but we needed to get them started in a, in a good, good quality of water. So, so there were things like that that we said, you know, we, recommendations we made is if you want this to be a serious marine lab, you're going to have to, there's going to have to be a pump on the, on the other side or somehow you're going to have to have higher quality water. That's really never been completely solved. They have a new tank, which is definitely better than the old wooden tank, um, but, and they do clear it out, clean it out and so forth on a regular basis, but it's still, uh, is is uh, not uh, high enough quality water, so they would and and it's a challenge because if you wanted to take water in from out here, uh, it would first of all the pipe would have to be quite a long ways out, 
and then it would have to come in here. It would either have to go all the way around the island or it would have to come up over 30 feet. Well, you can't raise water 30 feet without it. Um, yeah, so you, you, it, it, pumping it across the island would have been very difficult. So anyway, uh, that's why uh, that was never done. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned when we spoke in your office about the uh, the relationship between University of Florida and the refuge, and mm -hmm. you mentioned specifically, um, I think it's Litzenberg. Uh huh. Ken Litzenberg. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Yes, he was the refuge manager uh, through the, the project, the previous project. So in the '90s, uh, and we always had to have a permit uh, to work out here particularly in the spring, we had to have a special permit to work out here. But we were just working on the beach, so it really didn't disturb the birds very much. Um, and, but he was very, he used to say this island was about the birds. Um, so um, we just couldn't do anything that would disturb the, uh, so we wouldn't be allowed to go into any of the creeks or anything like that, which we didn't really need to do anyway. Um, but uh, yes, I mean, really, that's one of the most, well, to my thinking, one of the most wonderful things about the island is that it's a national wildlife refuge. And so it's uh, protected and uh, the birds are protected, but also the beach is protected and the whole environment is protected. Uh, people are not allowed up here, so it was a safe place for my students and myself to be able to work out here. Um, and uh, when, when we would do things like put flags in, we, we in, marked where the horseshoe crabs were nesting with uh, wire flags. And I've done this in other places and in other places. Now, I wouldn't mind so much people would steal my flags, but they don't. They move the flags. They pick the flags up and put them someplace else. And they are supposed to indicate where the eggs are when I come back. Uh, six hours later to be able to dig up the nests. And um, so it's very difficult to work on a beach where there are lots of people who move flags around. Uh, but out here, you can always depend on the flags being there. <laughs> and in fact, we did some projects where we had things. In fact, a student, uh, Christina Vasquez, who wasn't exactly my student, but I was working with her out here, um, we buried eggs and left them there for a couple of weeks, and you know nobody was nobody was disturbing them. So um, yeah, so it's really uh, quite unique in that way, in that there are people kind of guarding the island, and and, and people know that they can't come to the island just willy nilly, you know, and come up here. So wonderful. Thank you, Jane. Yeah. Is there anything else before we head down to the beach that you'd like to discuss about up here? Um, yeah, not, nothing that comes to mind at the moment. I should check my little list of theses, but I think I've got, I think I've got them. Yeah, we can talk about the horseshoe crabs on the, well, I, Great. I could start by talking about walking down that hill in the middle of the night. <laughs> 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 that, that was always a challenge. And, one time, like, I know Harvey likes those things, but one time I was walking along, I just was on my way down the hill, and there was a log across the path. I thought, that's strange. There's not been any wind. Um, I could see it up there, you know, it was, it was pretty good sized brown log across the path. And I got up to it and finally realized what that thing was. <laughs> <laughs> was not a log. It was one of Harvey's snakes. <laughs> and they were so big around, not very long, but very fat snakes. And one time I was washing dishes right here in this sink right here. And I was looking out this window and <laughs> I saw a squirrel going along and that squirrel was just kind of going along being a squirrel. And it jumped, I mean, like higher than you can possibly imagine any mammal would jump. It just leapt backwards. <laughs> and it had encountered, and it encountered a snake that was out there. They, they did not want to encounter snakes, those little squirrels. Right. 
The squirrels out here in the early days used to be white. There was a group of white squirrels out here. Really? And I don't know whatever happened to them, whether they died out or whether the mutation died out and the, you know, there got to be others that were gray, but, and monarch butterflies, yeah. Um, so yes, so going down here is quite a, a challenge. We do this, um, so horseshoe crabs nest on new and full moon high tides. And we have two high tides a day here. One is very comfortably in the afternoon, uh, you know, between one and five in the afternoon. And the other one is 12 hours later, <laughs> between one and or midnight and 4 a.m., something like that. And so we work, work both tides and we would come out here and um, uh, come down to the beach in the middle of the night and um, see who was there and collect our, our horseshoe crabs down there. And then um, uh, in the afternoon tide, we would tag them right away. And in the morning tide, we would leave them. Uh, we left them in, in uh, wading pools that were on the beach, little blue kitty wading pools. Uh, that had been filled with water. We left them there and um, let them, uh, and, and then came back in the morning and tagged them and um, weighed them, measured them, and tagged them. And um, we got pretty good returns on this beach of our tagged animals. Um, within a week, there were about 70% of them would come back. And uh, between weeks, of course, it was much less. A lot more males would come back than females. We don't want this to be a discussion of just horseshoe crabs, so you can stop me. <laughs> I get to talking about horseshoe crabs and well, that's great. It's all that's over. your passion. <laughs>